So today I'm going to talk about this book, Snuff, by Victor Pelevin. And uh, just to say that uh, Pelevin is one of two authors that I uh, get greatly exasperated with, and the other is Charlie Mielville. And uh, I get exasperated with them for pretty much the same reason, that they are brilliant sort of imaginative writers, they take on big themes, and they also manage to sort of completely undermine, in my opinion, they manage to undermine their own sort of brilliance by just doing some things that are really, really annoying. And it's very rare uh, that you find a book by them where you just think, yes, coherent, this works from beginning to end. So there's loads of great elements and there's loads of elements that just sort of unfortunately work, work against that. Um, now, uh, I'll probably give Mielville his own uh, treatment uh, <laughs> in one of these, but just to say that Myself, I've actually written t uh, a novel and a short story, uh, having been provoked by books that I've read in Mielville's. Um, and that hasn't happened with Pilevin. He's not provoked me to go out and write something. So I guess that means I find him slightly less exasperating than Mielville. Um, so just a, sort of a bit of background on Pilevin. So he grew up in Soviet Russia and uh, he was starting to get published just as the Soviet Union was collapsing all around him. And his work really sort of uh, hit a note uh, in that atmosphere. And, and in the same way as Murakami's Norwegian Wood became a sort of the book for Japanese youth, I think Pelevin's early work became, you know, the work for the new generations of Russians who were facing up to, you know, a bright new hope of, uh, of life not under communism. Um, I think there was a poll in the 2000s where, you know, Pelevin was, was the number one intellectual uh, as voted for by, by Russians. Um, and he did sort of win literary awards. There is a, a Russian Booker Prize, uh, which I was completely unaware of, and makes you think, well, why do we never see in translation uh, the books that do that do win that, uh, other than Pelevin, who's one of the few translated writers we do see. Uh, and interestingly, uh, his first novel was, uh, was not shortlisted, uh, despite the clamour for it to be. Uh, which is something that Mielville also experiences, I think. You know, he's never listed for the book, despite his legions of fans. And uh, the reason it wasn't listed was one of the judges said that uh, Pelevin represented uh, a threat of destroying cultural memory uh, of Russia, which is extraordinary if you think about it, an extraordinary claim for, for uh, a book of words. Um, but perhaps one aspirational, maybe not the destruction of cultural memory, but a sort of realigning of it. So that's the sort of the impact that, that he had. Uh, at least within Russia. Uh, his books are, uh, uh, they're always sort of uh, face-offs between um, life under sort of a, a sort of state materialism, such as as was Soviet Union, uh, the vestiges of the old Russia, which sort of crept back into society now that communism's fallen. So sort of mysticism, folklore, um, the Russian Orthodox Church, and his own Buddhism. Uh, so there's sort of the, the, the sort of the, Russian mysticism, but he himself is a is a very keen uh, studier of Buddhism. He goes on sort of annual uh, sort of um, trips to South Korea to study and further his understanding of, of Buddhism. And all his books, to some extent, are sort of these the battle of all these sort of ideas uh, and playing up against against each other. So uh, Omen Ra, uh, for example, was a book about. Uh, a guy who's forced to become a cosmonaut uh, to a one-way mission to space and he realises that in fact that, that he's never left Earth that uh, in all the same way of sort of uh, moon landing conspiracies in America but here it has more resonance because it's very much a metaphor of the collapse of Soviet Union and, and the illusion of, of Soviet greatness which can no longer be held up in, in the sort of the late 1980s. Um, another book of his is uh, called uh, The Life of Insects, which very much channels Kafka's metamorphosis in that there's sort of 14 stories of characters who are part insect, part human, and they keep sort of morphing between them as their sort of insect characteristics come out or their, their human ones. Uh, there's another book called, um, well, it actually has three titles, depending which country you're in, uh, in that sort of time-honoured fashion of Russian literature where characters have three names. Uh, in America, it was called Buddha's Little Finger, and in, in Britain, it was called The Clay Machine Gun. And it has two time settings. One is uh, revolutionary Russia uh, following Trotsky's Red Army trying to defeat the white Russians. And the other is a contemporary Russia. And it's not about time travel because you realise that it's a movement within a state of mind and consciousness. 
from one to the other, which is enabled by this sort of Buddhist device called the clay machine gun. It's a very a very Buddhist book. Uh, and then there's possibly the most coherent one that I've read up till previous to this, uh, called The Diary of a Werewolf, where sort of um, a were-fox, actually, uh, who is a prostitute, who just sort of seduces all these men, a bit like sort of um, Faber's Under the Skin. Uh, but then she meets a werewolf, and uh, it's all about this sort of love and power between them. And it's, it's, it's a pretty good book, actually. It's not as exasperating as, as all the others. Uh, and then we come to this, uh, Snuff. So uh, it's a post-apocalyptic world, uh, which basically is divided into two societies. One who lives above the ground, which has been despoiled by sort of nuclear radiation. Uh, and then the, the other is um, populated by uh, a species of, of, of humanity called orcs, and their, their country is called Ukraine. And I think there is in this book uh, an allegory about the whole situation in Ukraine with the sort of Russian going in and annexing uh, eastern Ukraine and re repatriating it to Russia. I don't know enough about the politics to know exactly how this is, you know, sort of pointing that out. Um, but it, I'm sure it's in there. And uh, the Orcs are very much a sort of second class uh, citizens. And they are used as the sort of the whipping boys and the scapegoats that holds together the, uh, the off-globe people because the technologies that have managed to survive are media-based. So all the high technology is up with the, uh, the off-globe people, but it's very much surrounded about, about sort of media and how they sort of create these illusions uh, for control. And it's very much done by using the orcs as their sort of raw material. So, for example, uh, they have drones which both have cameras, but also cannons and rockets, so that when they shoot, they're both shooting celluloid, or in digital form anyway, and they're shooting actual armaments. And there's an annual war between the two on the same day every year. And this is a media event. Um, not only is it a media event, but it's actually entirely choreographed by the TV companies. So there's this brilliant concept in it, for example, whereby the uh, the military clothes, and they're not military at all, they're sort of off the catwalks, but the military clothes worn by the orcs are designed by the off-globe people with televisionists in, in mind. So you have like three, detachment, three different detachments of orc, the orc army, because they always follow the same tactics every year. And they are kitted out according to how it's going to look on TV. It's fantastic. And the way this war... Is, is sort of is set up is that basically um, one of the protagonists of the book is a pilot of one of these drones and he works with what's called a discourse monger who is the sort of the, the TV presenter but also a philosopher and they go off in search of um, a televisual couple uh, who will be saved by them by their rockets from this drone from a roaring band of you know animalistic primitive orcs and therefore the war can take place because we need to help the orcs save them from themselves and their own sort of bestial behaviour. So there's this young orc couple who are sort of sneaking off to have sex and they're sort of suddenly rounded on by um, a, a sort of an orc uh, military brigade. This is all stage managed by the people uh, on the off globe. And this pilot and his discourse monger, they sort of save them from being sort of ravaged by sort of wiping out all the orcs and then gradually their story is projected up in the off-globe land and it's a cause for war, etc, uh, etc. Et and those two young orcs are then taken up uh, to continue their sort of the, the televised story to show, you know, they're sort of to the greater, you know, the greater sort of humanitarianism of, of the off-globe people. And gradually it's the second half of the book is about um, them discovering what, you know, life is like and the sort of two two-tier class system that you know they've escaped from uh the the female orc she sort of jumps into it with both feet because of consumerism that she can buy jewelry and stuff so she very much she's not bothered by the fact that she's a second class or was a second class citizen she doesn't seek to reform the system whereas the male orc is much more troubled by all by all of this and in truth the second half of the novel drags because once they're up in in the human world there's a lot of Pelevin talking ideas at you you know through the mouthpiece of this orc or the pilot or whatever but it's 
that's not really integrated organically like the, like the stuff about the war the war was and the other thing about the war is the pace of it is fantastic and again once they get up to the off globe and they're sort of mooching through museums and, and discovering machines and, and stuff it's the pace really slackens so potentially this is going to exasperate me but towards the end uh, for reasons that i'll come back to the the male orc has sort of stolen the pilot's girlfriend and the pilot is chasing after him and it's all very you know it's very plotless you know sort of how the pilot gets to this point of realization and then physically how he tracks the orc down and then go pursues him with the drone and all of this and it's sort of quite plot you know plot plodding and you think oh where are all the great ideas are at the first half of the book but the payoff and i'm not going to spoil this for you but the payoff is hilarious the final moment, the final denouement, uh, is very, very funny. And you think, ah, oh, okay, it was building up to this gag, really. Um, so not as exasperating as normal. Just about holds together as a book, I think. Um, but what's, I think the element that's really intriguing is also perhaps the most controversial element about, about this book. In that for all this sort of, the sort of greater scale of um, events between the two societies, and what's interesting is that even in the off globe, the space of the society is very cramped and compressed, but it's expanded out by the illusion of, of the sort of the, the uh, visual images projected. You know, they have views of all the old great places like London, and, and funny enough, New York is is one of the sort of you know the worst views that you can buy. You know, it's a bit like sort of real estate that the more money you have, you can buy better views, more interesting views, and New York is actually quite a low, a low view. So scale is quite interesting in this because it is a sort of global scale but actually the globe is shrunk to one tiny off globe community and and the orcs below and a lot of the orc areas is is uninhabitable because of sort of nuclear fallout and stuff so ostensibly you're having these sort of these global events between the two societies such as the war and its its aftermath and everything um but actually what you realize i think is that all of that stuff is influenced by love between a man and a woman, which I will expand on because it's not quite straightforward, man and, and a woman. That the central relationship of the drone pilot and his woman, who he can sort of, who's sort of unobtainable, he has her, but she's sort of unattainable. Um, that sort of that sort of impacts on everything that he does in his professional job, which will be sort of great social events, and really, that's that's the key to, to, to the book that for all this sort of stuff that's going around it's you know and it's very choreographed by the authorities and it's the same every year except with different fashion labels but actually it can be influenced by tiny things going on between this man and this this woman now okay so what is it about the man and the woman well he this drone pilot he never leaves his house all his drone control is like you're sort of playing an xbox or a playstation he's sat on his sofa he's overweight he's not a looker you know but he's an important person because he has this sort of irresponsible role the woman is not a is not a real human being flesh and blood human being she's a doll she's a sex doll but the technology she's the top of the range sex doll so she's been programmed with just all knowledge that exists in their society and then he has her on various settings for her emotions which are by his choice and he has her on maximum for spirituality but bitchiness is, is the other one that he has her on maximum and he's con by doing that he's constantly driving up the erotic charge because she rejects him and she calls him a fat blob and all, all this sort of insulting stuff um so there's a great great tension all the time between the two of them but he finds you know that's what gives him his erotic charge with her and yes she's a you know she's a rubber doll she's she's a slave and yet she speaks so eloquently and articulately and at various times wrests the power away from him and ultimately he does always you know get what he wants which is her in bed but her resistance and how difficult she makes it for him are really it's a really interesting treatment. Now, the controversy comes because he's accused of basically being sexist. And there's other things in the book about how the age of consent is 46 because the old lesbians, you know, they sort of, it's a way of sort of protecting themselves 
by uh, you know not admitting a youth culture and how that pornography uh, because the age of consent is so high uh, that anyone who's young they can't directly have sex on camera but but so what the pornography is is you show other people watching people have sex on camera so you're watching the the watchers and that is the pornography so there's again lo lots of brilliant ideas on that so i think the first thing to say about this accusation of, of him being sexist is if you read diary of a werewolf the woman the the werefox is absolutely the dominant character in that you know men even though she sort of uh, has this partner who's a, a male were a werewolf she is you know she is the leader and the driver of that book so i don't think pelevin is sexist yes you could say the thrust of this book has a sexist angle but i think i think the real interest of the book is is in the psychology of this this sex doll because she's more intelligent she's as manipulative because her settings have been set on maximum for bitchiness and spirituality which sort of oh, it's not the mic over there which work work against each other um, so the bitchiness, for example, is apart from sort of insulting him to his face and, and all of that. But gradually she wants to make him jealous and she picks the young orc uh, as if she wants to seduce him to make the male partner, the human male partner, jealous. And there's a lot of interplay between between the, the, the two of them. And she has power an awful lot of time. Yes, he can switch her off and put her in sort of whole pause mode. So... I guess, as I say, you could say he has the ultimate power, but in the end, she defeats him because, she, you know, he keeps saying, what is there in there? She's not alive. She doesn't have a soul. What, you know, what is it that sort of, you know, how much of that thought that she comes out with that defeats him a lot? How much of that is, it can't all just be imitative programming. It can't all be algorithms. You know, what is it? And because there's this sort of um, ambiguity in him about he's just not quite sure. And what she eventually points out to him is, is, well, you, you know, OK, I may not have a soul and I may not have a consciousness, but do you think you do? You know, you believe in this sort of God that sort of over oversees all of this, this society. But if there's a God, then you're no better than, than me as a rubber doll. And equally, um how can I put this? Because this, this is quite a, a, a tricky thing. You're a slave to forces within you that you don't understand. You know, the electrochemical stimuli of pleasure and, and pain, you could you only respond to them. And that drives your pleasure or that drives your anxiety or whatever. But, you know, you're no more in control of them than I'm in control of my own sort of programming. And that's how she sort of defeats him, really. I think she does have the power, you know, despite the fact that she has the lowest status because she's a, you know, a, a sex doll and, you know, she has no free will and all of this. But ultimately, she she shows that, in fact, she's superior because she has a greater appreciation of that, that he's actually in the same boat. And the difference between her and him is she knows she is and he doesn't. And I think that makes her incredibly powerful and, and incredibly interesting. So I don't think this is a sexist book at all. I mean, I, yes, there's satire. And on the surface, it's quite crude and, and sort of, you know, about gender. But I think it's far more sophisticated than that. And, I, you know, the first half of this book was just, you know, a fantastic read, really pacey, lots of ideas. You know, there's a, you know, and it, there's a satirical element. So, um, for example, uh, you know, there are because they've lost the records of history because of the, the apocalypse. But they've got little bits, little scraps of it, and they sort of forge a new sort of orthodoxy out of that. So some of the names of, of the characters, uh, David, Goliath, Arafat, Zuckerberger is, is one character. So brilliantly bringing forward, you know, Zuckerberger, who's, of course, Mr. Facebook, uh, and Yasser Arafat, who, of course, you know, the PLO and, and you know, the Jew-Palestinian thing there. Uh, David, Goliath is part of his name because of the, 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 the asymmetrical nature of, of their struggle. Or there's another one here, um, Nicholas Olivier Lawrence von Trier. So there you've got, you know, Lars von Trier, who was, uh, who is a sort of, you know, quite an avant-garde filmmaker, and sort of Lawrence Olivier, who sort of represents um, you know, sort of the classical acting. Um, there's uh, the 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 head of the Orcs, who's called the Kagan, 
uh, their names are well first of all they're chosen by the off-grade people but their names you know one is called Torn Jurex and his replacement is called Torn Trojan there's a lot of quite witty funny stuff uh, like that in here so all of that stuff carries you through the first half really and it's a bit disappointing in a way when a lot of that stuff falls off in the second half that he's not producing that many new sort of quite funny things and but he is still throwing the ideas at you you know the the dialogues between the sex doll and the and the pilot and also the slightly less interesting i think ones of the orcs discovering things about the world which reflect back on their own sort of second class position but this I, you know i highly rec recommend it as i say for Pelevin, for me it all comes together in this book in a way that it doesn't in others of his books um, this was published in 2011, and I don't think there's been anything since. He's a bit of a recluse. He sort of hides himself away. Um, but I do hope that he's still writing, but there's sort of six years since this with, with nothing that I've seen. Um, so I hope, you know, I look forward to the next one. Okay, uh, till next time, um, and maybe a future China Mielville uh, special. Okay, thanks.